You can come up whenever you want. Anyway, uh, welcome to the uh, Rocky Mountain Adventist Association meeting for March 11th. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I'm Roger Jackson on the board of the Rocky Mountain Inventors and uh, make arrangements for the meetings and presentations. Uh, we meet the second and fourth Mondays of the month uh, here at Denver Community Church at 1101 South Washington Street in Denver um, from 7 to 9 p.m. And then uh, occasionally on special announcements, we'll have training at the uh, Denver Public Library downtown branch, usually for PAC searching and sometimes at the Denver PAC office uh, at 1961 Down Street. Um, so those will be announced separately. And uh, just remember, if you've uh, got an invention and you haven't already publicly disclosed it, uh, be sure to keep it confidential so you don't start the clock on the one-year disclosure rule in the United States. Um, keep in mind, if you may want to file for a foreign patent application, uh, you should not disclose at all. It's usually a good idea business-wise not to. So the, uh, the topic tonight is uh, what the Patent Office calls uh, Section 101, which is uh, subject matter eligibility for patent application. So you may wonder, gee, <laughs> what is that? Well, it, um, a lot of inventions, uh, it, it's not even an issue. Like if you have a, a gadget or a, a physical device, it usually doesn't come up. Uh, primarily comes up in uh, process inventions and namely uh, what is called business methods and software. So these all are kind of a result of a step-by-step uh, -step process of something. And of course, uh, a lot of applicants want to claim very broadly, so they'll, they'll be intentionally um, unspecific uh, in things, and of course, there's a limit on what the patent office will allow in that area. So, the presentation that was emailed out to our membership, it's 200 slides. Uh, of course, we're not going to have time to go completely through that. Uh, this was based on uh, just last month's presentation to the examiners for training on what's called a patent subject matter eligibility, section 101 for patent office examiners. Uh, the thing that's really great about this presentation is probably almost half of it, uh, close to say 78 pages, has got examples of subject matter eligibility, yes, subject matter, subject matter eligibility, no. So you can get a feel for this because talking about this uh, is a little bit of more difficult comprehend and understand. So with the examples, it can be made um, a little bit more clear. <clears throat> okay. Uh, is there any questions? Have you done many software hacks, Roberto? A few. A few. The, um, I had one uh, negative experience, which was the rejection of one of the actual, yeah, the software system that, that was uh, was a, a, a new method for refinancing a house, for financing a, a property, a purchase of a house. A oh, new okay. method. So it's a business a, method. A business method with really software. Computerized yeah. business method. And the, the, it was allowed, uh, and then before paying the, the issue fees, the pattern was a bit wrong because of the Alice uh, new regulation that came out. I mean, that it was allowed and then it was pulled back. Oh, yeah. Oh. If you don't pay the. Yeah. Right. 
because they did um, the history here, and you know, I'm just giving it in a very summary and no guarantee this is exactly accurate, but uh, up till 1996, software patents really didn't get it approved much at all. Right. When they were trying to patent algorithms and right. stuff like that without any specific end uses, too, too generic, too broad. And then, um, I'm not going to remember all the cases, although I probably should do this, but just generally, um, after 96, they started allowing software patents. And then, so by the late 90s, uh, lots and lots of software patents yes. were filed and allowed. Yes. And probably uh, more than should have been. And right. then there was some public pressure about um, the too many, too many broad patents being allowed, and then they were being challenged and some invalidated. So the patent office tightened up yeah. these rules quite a bit, but it was never. It had a lot of uh, amorph amorphousness in it and uncertainty, and it was kind of hard for applicants to really know the right lines. On basically, it. basically, the new regulation that they introduced. Yeah. Uh, because of the famous Alice case uh, was that the, the if the software uh, the information system that is need to be patented can run on a generic computer, then is a no no. That one of the reasons for the Yeah, that, and then the second well, that was coming from uh, I think it was the Bilski case, you know, the machine yeah, the transformation. Right, right, which right. This case, I mean, and then Alice yes. kind of uh, right. made it worse. And I, it just it, it became like people were like, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. trying to pass software is difficult, and yeah. just uh, we'll keep our copyright on it. Yeah. And then the second issue, the second issue is still related to Alice. The second condition for uh, eventually overcome the Alice uh, rejection is that the the software need to make changes to the computer itself for the on which is around. Yeah, the change of state. Right. Change of state. Right. Yeah. Make changes. So it's uh, yeah. not easy yeah. sometimes to uh, do because uh, most of the time people developing software want to have a, a, a generic system that there are not on any kind of computer. Right. <laughs> so right. that's the challenge. So that's a my experience. So what kind of software happened? So what ultimately happened with that software happened then? He was rejected and then he finally said uh, because we had to make some significant changes, and then the, the inventor kind of abandoned, did not uh, have any any fund or whatever to pursue the prosecution. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's what I, it would be interesting to to continue to 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 be able to to see if these amendment try to. Remove the as much as possible the computer side uh, of the patent application. Uh, it would be interesting to see if we was able to overcome the this other objection and the one on one. Yeah, is that accountability? The, the way it was put forth by examiners. I mean, after Alice, and software was like looking to be extremely difficult to just get through one on one. Forgetting about one or two, one or three, probably not obvious. Sure. But those, those was that you needed uh, some sort of piece of unique hardware sure. integrated with the software, and then you were in a um, yeah, subject matter. So it, it had to be software that um, had a unique interaction. Excuse me, hardware that you need yeah, so with the software. Right. Yes. So right. it could be a generic computer with memory processor. It had to be right. something like uh, an eyeball iris reader or a fingerprint yes. reader yes. that the system used uh, to do what it needed to do or something like that. Yes. So now some people have been getting some software patents in areas with 
without that, but it, it can be difficult. Um, I know that like image, image recognition is big, sure. and those patents have been, I think, going through for the most part, and um, they're not necessarily using special hardware. I mean, you know, you're using a, a conventional digital camera or something, but the software is converting the uh, image. image into data, basically, mm -hmm. so that the, the data can tell you something about the image, like something as crazy as uh, taking a picture of a particular house, and it'll tell you that the age and the architectural style mm -hmm. is from the picture, That's or a picture of a car sure. being able to ascertain the year, the make, the model, and all that, so smart picture instead of just a solid sure. smile. Sure, sure. Anyway, um, it's Scott. Yeah. Sure. Um, did you ever have any experience with software or patenting or a process? No, I'm, I've always just been interested in learning about the trademarking of like, you know, brands. And things. Okay. So that's what I want to know more about. Okay, I just want to make sure if you had any burning questions. <laughs> no, it was just about the trademark. Okay. So anyway, yeah, kind of, uh, I, I can thumb through some of this. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, this is a presentation in late February uh, for examiners. And uh, like I said, this is 200 slides. We won't be going through everything. And this is, uh, I guess this is still got its public comment period. So there still could be some changes here, but it, it looks like they, they've added some steps and got some um, flow charts and stuff to, to give some uh, better criterion for everybody to follow. I mean, that, that's the whole goal of this. So when you get a client in with a software invention and they want to pack, you don't have to go, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> this is gonna be really, uh, difficult or you just flat out, you know, don't do it or say, well, we can go for it. Because the, uh, I mean, the one-on-one -on -one stuff can be kind of difficult to fight because if you're rejected against prior art, 102, 103, you've got to define thing, right? right? And you can work around it. Sure. But one-on-ones no is very amorphous, you know, no it's like option. kind of inherent invention. And, and if you have to add content, to get around one of one, you might have to file a continuation to get that you know, new matter in. That, that's you may not what have they it. did in order to, yeah. to really remove as as much of the general computer. That's so it's just uh, yes. if you start with the patent office's view of the world, I mean, this and this is a lot of I don't know my opinion of all this, just in a summary sense. I mean. The world is in three parts, okay? There's the abstract world, there's the natural world, and then there's the man-made world, okay? So the abstract world is, you know, the supernatural and uh, <laughs> metaphysical and all this stuff that's like, uh, um, not definitely, it's more belief stuff. And right. then the natural world, of course, is, you know, the mountains, the plains, uh, flora and fauna, you know, anything that's, occurs in nature without human intervention. Right. And then, then the, the law, the natural laws, right? The law of physics and the law of chemistry, the law of Right, it happens without human Right, yeah, yeah they are there. So, so those two areas, the um, abstract world and the uh, natural world, are not patentable. You know, you can only patent, and this, this can apply to trademark and copyright too. It's only human created things. Only human created. So it has to be something that isn't occurring in, in nature and all this. And, you know, sometimes people go, well, that's obvious or something, but you know, a lot of like biotech inventions and something, and there can be something going on with a composition that occurs in nature and someone's trying to pack. There's a lot of hairs to split on this stuff, honestly. Anyway, so we have 
the very first, the first very raw test of subject matter eligibility has to be human created. And, um, but you know, of course, that alone isn't enough. That's just the very first step. So after that, we say, okay, if you take a typical process invention, and you know, we'll just talk business method software, we have uh, three things going on. We've got data, and that can be public or private. It can be natural, it can be man-made, whatever. And then you use that data, and then you manipulate the data, right? And then you have output, right? So data, manipulation, output. Okay. So that's kind of the essence of um, play software. We'll just call it this software. Um, let's see. What's the abbreviation of PG? What's that? What's the PG? For? That means Patent Eligibility Guideline. Okay. That's just an acronym they use. So I'm sorry, I'm just like, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, hmm. So this is probably too hard to see. Um, but there's the... Uh, The very first test that was always in place, you can probably see it on this right up a little better. Um, the classes of uh, uh, basic patent eligibility, it has to be a machine, process, article of manufacturing, <coughs> which is a product or a gadget, or a composition of matter, which is you know, some mixture, I guess you could say. Um, but again, it has to be human. Maybe it can occur in nature, right, or something. And so uh, a machine is, you know, something that makes the article manufactured product. The process is a series of steps. And then uh, sometimes they call it article, but it's typically, you know, your gadget, your product. And so most inventions under high domain, the air for machine, process, article, manufacture, composition of matter, they're usually refinements or improvements or new combinations. Very few inventions are 100% random stuff. The minority are. But usually some an improvement or a new combination. So you usually get to, um, is the improvement or new combination different than what exists? And is it not obvious? It's usually telling me. Yeah, happily. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, the test after is it human created? Is it the machine, the process, or the manufacturer, composition, and So software is going to come under process. So it's human created, it's process, okay. So we pass those tests. Okay. Now, based on that, you know, you could try to patent uh, like a basic equation, like uh, F equal M A or something. You know, people could try to do this. And so, this is where we get into this next step of: is it something that has a generic application? The government's patent office is not going to give you a monopoly on something that has 
and open in an application like an algorithm like that. Right. And that, that's really always been true. Uh, you can probably patent the algorithm, but the, you need to have input and how it is produced. You cannot just be an abstract algorithm, not have a specific application, right? Right. So that's, that's, I guess you call it the first filter, and then we come into this next step in the flow chart. Oh, the two prong, there's a problem in the Yeah. So you need to do the others, the two prong, the two I would just, um, this is, this can get kind of <laughs> wound up here, but um, I guess the deal you'd have to say, probably there's a seminal case, I always remember it, it's the diamond rear case, it's the rubber curing. Uh, that's a great example of does an algorithm have application to a uh, fixed application? Okay, in other words, is it narrowed down to a specific field of use and application? So this is what uh, takes you away from being able to pack one half MV squared or F equal MV or some, some algorithm. You, you can patent that if, well, you'll pass one-on-one -on -one subject matter eligibility if that's applied to a specific, specific. use. Okay, and so that's where... Um, and generating an output. Right. The, the diamond rear was um, the curing of rubber in the mold, so that's mm -hmm. vulcanization. Mm -hmm. It's like a heat treatment of rubber. Right. And um, so it, it effectuates a um, permanent chemical change to rubber. It strengthens it considerably, right? Like the tensile strength goes from 300 psi to like 7,000. Absolutely essential for like a tire, you know, to stay together from raw rubber. Right. And um, so this heat treatment of rubber is all based on uh, time temperature control, like any heat treatment. And so it's long been known that there was an algorithm, and I think it's called the Arrhenius equation or Harris equation. It's been known for many, many years that um, it's the theoretical ideal of this time and temperature control, I think, for rubber. So the diamond rear case, they were trying to patent the software for this. And so you can say, well, the, the base equation is old in the art, it's prior art on this. But um, I guess you could also say they had it tied to hardware because it was, their specific application was curing of rubber to a specific use. And uh, so they had hardware with integrated, I mean, software with integrated hardware that um, facilitated an almost uh, idealistic control of the time and temperature per the equation. Right. So that was patentable. Right. And I think, well, it passed subject matter eligibility. We won't worry about novelty and unobviousness, but it was a general algorithm or a no when I say prior algorithm, sure. but it had a specific application and it also had some integrated hardware. So that that kind of software invention is pretty solid. I mean, the ones that, that are trickier are, you know, the business method ones, right? We don't have hardware. Now, you can say with the business method, okay, it's human created, it's a process, and it may even have a specific application, like you said, to the finance. Uh, or um, 
generate credit scores or um, optimization or something like that. But there is, and there's a lot of examples here. You know, they talk about, um, does it go into a practical application? If it goes into practical application, it is good for 101 uh, at the bottom here. Roger, I hate to interrupt you. Are we going to talk about anything with trademarking at all, or is this just pretty much? Not for this presentation, kind of doing the video. So. All, right. all right. I want to mosey if you don't mind. Then. So okay. It's kind of uh, grab some more food on the way, way out. out. It's all over my head, so. Yeah. <laughs> grab some more food. Good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Now, there's, there's another thing with software, <laughs> um, and I'm just looking where they talk about it, but it gets back to, the, kind of back to Bilski with the, uh, the change of state or transformation. So what this does is that even if you have the, the process that's human made and it has a specific application, it has to uh, cause something to change. I would call it that the software has to be self-contained. Now, the rubber curing, perfect, right? We had a change of state, the rubber cured, mm -hmm. right? It went through its vulcanization and, and, and hardened and strengthened. So that's why that one was so solid. But if you get into something like uh, Marketing and finance. Um, there could be some difficulties here, and uh, ones that people may not understand. Um, I believe that the man problem is still part of the man problem, right? And the man problem. Even uh, if it's uh, related to finance and, uh, and uh, I believe that is the use of the computer that, that makes things more difficult. But I believe uh, business methods are still patentable. Am I wrong or right to say? Just looking for um, the example. This, this could be it. I mean, the one that says not particular. Um, even though the software has a, a specific application, if, if the output part is open-ended, like um, this one says, uh, the claim recites administering a suitable medication to a patient. That's pretty open-ended. Now, what that 
What that says is the human with the expertise has to come in and finish the job to determine what's the suitable medication. Yes. So you've got a human having to be the step in the process. I think maybe an easier example is um, a marketing program. You know, that they gathers sales statistics or website use statistics or something like this. And then it generates an output and it basically groups and organizes those statistics into like an easily understandable form. But it's just statistics and so that is still in a fail 101 because the output is uh, is sort of indefinite or generic in a sense. In other words, um, something like that. It takes uh, marketing data, manipulates it in a form to make it into a report, let's say. It's easy to understand. But all you've really done is convert data. It's no different than, you know, inches to millimeters or dollars to euros. You still have this output here that does not what? Do a change of state or transformation. It's just the data presented differently. It'd be like, uh, I take data and I present it in graphical form from numbers, or I flip that around and I take the graph and present it as numbers. What are you changing for a state? Nothing. Someone's got to look at the data and then the human has to make a decision on what to do. So that's, I guess I would just call it an open-ended output, but that is not going to pass 101 for that. Even though it's a specific field of use, it doesn't, um, I guess I would word it like it doesn't cause something to happen. Like, like maybe an example would be uh, the financial program calculates a credit score and it's an automated, say, loan approval. And it says, okay, score this level, this level, this level, loan approved, loan disapproved. Okay, so that makes a decision happen, right? It's a change of state. There, the program has a more specific output. Then there is also one issue is the ethical issue. Like, uh, when we try to get the monopoly of something that the entire humanity would benefit. And, uh, for example, I had a friend who, uh, the idea was to eventually get a patent on, uh, on a rehydration method for, for patients that are suffering the hydration, you know, the, to save lives. You know, there's some specific method and so on. Mm -hmm. But even though it could eventually be patented, or what do you see? There's some medical patent that uh, could raise the issue of ethic, right? Mm -hmm. Because the patent you try to exclude others from using the same the same method that would save lives. I don't know if you have any, any uh, input on that sweep, those, those kind of patterns. Yeah, there are columns, a particular transformation, but I don't know, oh, it's okay. kind of a change of state. Oh, okay. Um, okay. There's, there's a lot more examples in here we've got time for, but just to... Sure. Um, Yeah, they're talking about data gathering could be unique. Mm -hmm. Usually the focus is on the output. 
Right. Yeah. The need to be practical use of the output. I'm trying to look for the, um, the example. See how many examples they have. They got 30. One more. 33. <laughs> Lots of them. Um, 36. But things like um, the volume of data don't really help you. Um, you know, that comes under that as well, but also the obvious. If you're just automating what could be a known manual process, that's not necessarily patentable. Even though the computer can handle large amounts of data better than a human. Yeah. yeah. There is really no mental status. So this is where the, the uh, yeah, examples. Exactly. So this is really helpful, especially with this topic. Um, Yeah, now this is kind of interesting. So this was a software that um, organized icons on your screen. Okay. Um, so it's a process, it's a specific use, so it's good on those. Uh, So was the uh, determining based on icon use, rearranging the high use ones in a certain area, the low use in another area? Okay. Which most computers have now, like they'll have a group of your most common use. Yeah, and so you can reference those faster. Um, So here it says, okay, what's the criterion for determining icon use? Uh, and then this is as claimed, because that's all that counts is how it's claimed. Isn't it? It's by the, uh, the use of each icon in the processor. And then automatically moving the most used icons to uh, position of choice, okay. Um, so step one, is it a process? Yeah. And then um, determine uh, falls from the grouping's abstract ideas. So, Okay, so I think, you know, they're saying if it falls into one of these categories, it's not going to pass one on one. Because, you know, mathematical concept, mental processes, and uh, thing, things related to organizing. So, um, common 
is observed in the human mind from the observation, evaluation, judgment. <coughs> It says here, uh, for example, but for the biprocessor language, the claim encompasses the user manually calculating the use of each icon. So you can do this in your head, right? You know, yeah. yes, <laughs> you know the icons you use the most, pretty much, and you can mm -hmm. just you know click and drag and move them. Okay, so it says that's the claim recites a mental process. Are there and then. Uh, Step two, eight, prompt two, are there additional elements or combination elements in the claim that apply, rely, or use the judicial exception imposes a meaningful limit? Okay. So the claim as a whole integrates the mental process into a practical application. So I think it's only the line that says the processor is doing it makes it eligible under 101. Because, you know, you could imagine that processor uh, term there. I could generically claim that as, uh, you know, not saying how it got there, just saying that the highest used icons move to the, say, lower left corner. I just say that right. I wouldn't say how they got there. So that would pass muster on one of one. Yeah. I mean, so they have to use the they have to limit it to the criterion. Yeah, I believe mean, this system would do better yeah. than you would in your mind that way, right? So here's um, this claim too, which is what I was just saying. Um, The criterion is the use of each icon, determining the amount of use of each icon, and uh, automatically moving. Um, mm. Now this one, uh, Talks about memory allocation. It's interesting. <laughs> oh, because they're using the memory in order to determine the day that was used. Very good, Okay, so this is the claim too. They added memory to the processor for eligibility. I mean, for criterion for icon usage. Now let's look at a third claim. Uh, okay, so this one is very generic. The claim this is ranking the icons by the processor based on the amount of use. No specific process or memory. So you can bet this one is not going to be a full uh, 101 allowed. 
Okay, so going through everything. Here's the process, it's a specific application. Um, is the arrow yeah. the choice of what is different? Right? The fact that, that, that the other one was actually moving the icons to a specific corner on the entire list. Right, so they, they tell you in the purple box here. If it's, you know, not using the processor or memory, it's something that could be a mental process. They're process and the amount of use of that icon. If we go back to point two. Well, this has the addition of memory allocation. Yeah. So that made it eligible. Let me look at the slide. I think it does move automatically the icons to the corner. I don't know about this. Means that would be the defined output. Tangible, kind of tangible results, right? Okay, so yeah, determining the processor, automatically moving the most used that. Okay. So claim two, I get the claim one. Okay, we got a processor that's limited by use and time. If we go to three. Hmm, this is a little bit different, it's kind of subtle. It says, the use over a predetermined amount of time. Sure, you might select a different time. It's a subtle difference, but I think it's like, it takes it like an hour and says, okay, you've used these icons more or less than other ones. But the other one was the use of each icon. Do you think? Well, you can say sort it according to one month of use or six months of use. I think that's the essence of what it is. Yeah, so this is says the use of the icon over some fixed time interval. Now, if we go back to one. Um, Uh, 
the amount of use of each icon over a predetermined period sounds like the same thing almost. But the second is not the rearranging. Well, really, you know, that one, that term is the same, I think. It says ranking, and, and the other one, is a you see the last line, it says ranking. The other one said rearranging. Huh? The other one said you move them to a specific place. So that's a specific uh, right? Automatically moving the, the most used icons yes. to a position closest to the start. So that's the difference. That's the difference. Right? Yeah. So the output is a, is a specific and tangible in a way that you can read. It's, it's a, uh, so I guess you can say, in the, the icons, moving the icons was a change of state. Right. Whereas the other one, we just said, I'm going to rank on it. Okay. Well, 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 uh, yeah. Then you don't do anything about that. Yeah. I'm going to go through like one more example. Let's see. My I'm going the right way. I guess this is kind of gets to does it go outside of conversion? I guess you could say analog to digital is not necessarily a straight conversion, it's got modification to it. Right? It's not, you know, inches to meters or something. <laughs> So that's probably why, because they say it, it can't be a mental process. Now this one, um, image recognition is big now. These, for sure. it, as far as I know, these software patents are pretty solid. For sure. Yeah. It looks like, yes. Um, Special detection of the outputs. There's also specific use of specific outputs. Because it's um, a photo to data is not a straightforward conversion. It's a interpreted conversion, right? Because the software would have to look at images compared to database, colors, and resolution. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not straightforward. Right? <clears throat> so it's eligible, yeah. Mind train never attracted me. <laughs> um, so, like I said, there's lots of examples here that to look at. Sure, sure. Um, we're just on slide 121. <laughs> So um, we measure uh, collected traffic data to a threshold data, right? You think this is patentable or not? Sure. I think this thing is still the output. The output is really just. You, you went over um, limit one or something. It's the same. It's the threshold yeah. that's greater than that. Uh, that doesn't look patent for mm -hmm. uh, I guess really their their patent their subject matter eligibility comes into the one. The claim is directed to an improvement in the collecting of traffic data. So you remember like there's you collect data, you analyze and output. So now we're looking at the collection. As the uh, and also, uh, output is only a uh, yes or no. Right, right. You, you're above or below a limit. Right, about the thing. Yeah. So, so I think this would be, would pass muster on 101 if it didn't have a unique data collection. That's the way I mean. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Claim is eligible. Now, okay, now they're going to do a different way of claiming it. Let's see what they say here. Uh, you two version of this one every time. One that, that might pass and one that is not passing. Okay. For which example, is, is that the tool? Uh, yeah, I think I think that's that probably a good assumption. You're saying passive, not passive. Yeah, depending on the claims. Uh, yeah. The claims are, are, are really um, uh, done. Because it's the same output. We're still just comparing to the threshold. Um, Okay, so so you can have to uh, more right. <laughs> yeah. So we had to be kind of positive compared to the network values to the network values and the data provided that show. And then, see, there is no practical use. You compare them, right? And then you stop. Yeah. Right? Because it's the same output. It's the same output between these two claims. 
Uh, it's just the data uh, collections. Oh, different. the collections of the new cards? Yeah. So collecting by the network appliance. Let's go back and see what one says. Collecting additional data relating to the network traffic. So this one, it has an added step at the end. It yeah. looks like. Yeah. Right. It still doesn't say exactly what you do with the output. It's just uh, stopping mm -hmm. the comparison and then, uh, then what? Because I just remember if the output is something that a human has to read and interpret, uh, I don't want to get into this one, it's <laughs> encryption. Uh, it's too late to do that one. <laughs> wow, yes, yes. Uh, Uh, let's see, 831. I was just, um, maybe this one. I'll just think one more example of something more basic. So I don't you know, this kind of comes under like, you know, picture image sensing. So that they say they're taking databases of different formats and converting them to a standard. So there's some intelligence there in uh, effectuating the standardization. I would say this is this is one on one day, but uh, even though the output is just information, but I suppose you could say it's a change of state. So it is the, the conversion, I guess, because the, the conversion is unique. I, I guess I would look at it that way. It's more than just converting data to a graph or something. It's true. Because, well, it's the interpretation thing, right? I mean, 
data to a graph is an exact representation. Mm -hmm. But here they're saying, while well, we're taking all these non-standardized formats and rolling them into a standardized, so we have to interpret how to modify these. I know it's not always clear, but. <laughs> oh, sure. I think also you need to yeah. analyze that with a certain, certain time here. If we don't have that. <clears throat> now, here's a. Uh, if I explain the map, but see, they, they have two versions. They, they, because they're changing the second part. Yeah, this one is just, um, this just allows multiple users to edit. I think this one will be in that. Taking bets? <laughs> sure. We'll play the role of examiner here. <laughs> Okay, problem one, it's abstract. Problem two. I wonder if there's some inside. Uh, generally applying the concept of story and updating information. The computer components are recited at a high level of generality. We have to have a Oh, we made it. We're done. It took the all this time. <laughs> well, like I said, most of it was examples, which, um, yeah, you know, is, is helpful. Yeah, like I said, I need mean, to look at the Support and I'll, uh, I'll turn off the recorder. Oh. Well, that was fun for us. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. Um, for somebody.